The Lord laid a word on my heart several weeks ago and laid it very strong. And I seek the Lord to see if there was something else that he wanted me to speak on and he was silent, simply saying, I already gave it to you, now go. Today is going to be a revelation of a, a, what I would call a heavier word, a heavier understanding of where we are. We're going to talk about the season that we're in right now. The Bible says, I believe it's Amos 3 and 7, that God won't do anything on the earth without revealing it to his servants, the prophets, first. And I can tell you now that the people with the Spirit of God in this room, and I have some people in here with the Spirit of God in here, can feel the same things that I'm talking about, that the season that we're in, particular in, the, in America, but across the world, is changing rapidly. We are going towards what the Bible describes as the end times. And the Bible talks about how the end times will go. Matter of fact, it gives a lot of details of this time period that we're going into. If you study the word, you'll find that the Bible talks about the end time almost more than anything else. It talks about this time that we're going into, the great falling away we've heard, where people are running from God instead of to God, where people are starting to take the lies of the world and, and turn them into and try to make them false truths. That is where we are getting to, and seasons are shifting rapidly. But in Matthew 24, when Jesus described this time period that we're going to, he said, don't worry, it's coming, but this is just the beginning of sorrows. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Do we not have that right now? He said, but this is the beginning of sorrow. He said there will be famines. See, we, we, we start to call it things like supply chain shortages just to prepare you for what is coming. He says, and pestilences, which would be COVID-19 and future ones. And he said, but... The end is still not yet. This is simply preparation for what's coming. Then he says, he ends it with this. And then this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And then the end will come. Now he said this gospel, a specific one. When you use a word like this, that means there's more than one gospel. But he said, the season will shift where the other gospels that were preached. I had a time period where I needed you to just preach about salvation so people could be saved. So I sent Billy Graham. I had a time period when I sent healing. I had a time period where different gospels were preached. But at the end, they will speak about the thing that Jesus spoke about every time he opened his mouth. And he called it the kingdom of God. Yeah. This gospel will be preached, and then the end will come. I was here at Anointed Dove the first time I stumbled upon this gospel. I preached on the kingdom. It was the first time. I had been spending too much time listening to Miles Monroe. I preached on the kingdom of God, but something hit me when I finished, and the the, the power that hit me, I had never had anything like this before. Y'all know me. I was raised around here. Y'all know I'm, I'm, I don't go too, too spiritual. I, I love God, and I, I'm very, very spiritual, but I don't uh, go too to the, far to the point of visions and a lot of that. But God gave me my first vision, and he didn't make it easy on me. Mine lasted 30 days. Y'all ever had a vision that lasted 30 days? I didn't even know if it was, if it was just me. <laughs> it lasted 30 days. As soon as I spoke on the kingdom of God here in this church, a fire came in me. And I've had the fire before. You know, you go home, you eat a steak, go down to New Orleans, watch the Saints game, relax, you all right. This one didn't go away. It just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I became so thirsty, the only thing I was able to do for, and I'm not exaggerating, 12 to 18, maybe 20 hours a day was to read the Word of God. 
It was so insatiable that I literally couldn't even sleep. I had to open the Bible and just read nonstop. And the fire lasted for two weeks. And I tried to work during this time. Praise the Lord, I own my own business because I don't know what I was doing because the fire was so strong. I went to the bank one day trying to make a deposit for my office and the teller asked me a question. And I don't know what I tried to say, but when I opened my mouth, it came out in tongues. I sent myself back home <laughs> and read the word. And then after that two weeks was over, then I physically saw two glass pitchers of water pouring water inside, to, inside both sides of my brain. And everywhere I walked, I physically saw these glass pitchers of water walking with me. Y'all don't understand. I don't get things like this. This was strange for me. So I stayed myself at home and read the word for two more weeks. And at the end of the 30 days, I woke up and simply understood. And the only thing just about what God spoke to me about that entire 30 days was his kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah. And he said, the seasons are changing, and this is the word that we are going to have for these end times. I came and brought a government, is what Jesus said. Jesus called it a government. A, he said it was a country. He said it was a city. He didn't describe it like a religion anymore. He said, I brought a government inside of you, and all the power that I demonstrated, he opened his mouth and said, the kingdom of God is like this. And then he would heal somebody and say, that's how it works. A country, a kingdom. I want to talk to us about a message from Jesus that was hidden in his first miracle. In John chapter 2. John chapter 2, a message from Jesus about the kingdom. Seasons are changing. Let's dive into the word. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it reads like this. And the third day there was a marriage in, the, in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called unto the marriage, to, uh, and his disciples to the marriage. Verse 3, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Wine here represents the spirit of God. Amen. But when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said, they have no wine. Does it not seem that a lot of times we are running out of wine, even in the sanctuaries and the churches of today's time? We are running out. Yeah. Verse 4, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I do with thee for mine hour? is not yet come. Yeah. All right. All right. Today I'm going to talk about that one line. My hour is not yet come. So, let me keep going. Verse 5, his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. I love that. That, that I love this interaction between Jesus and his mom. I need you to understand that this is Jesus' first miracle. Uh, you understand? That means she hasn't seen him do anything yet, yet she knows what's in her son. Sometimes the, God, the leader that God puts over you knows what's in you before you're ready. He said, my hour is not come yet, and she didn't even acknowledge what she said. See, he said, she just turned around and said, just do what he says. She just ignored what he says, and just do what he says, and so he moved. And he said, and there were six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Understand what's happening here. Number one, they ran out of wine. In Galilee, the weddings last seven days. Seven days. All right, this is a seven-day wedding. All right. Somewhere around the third day, they ran out of wine. This is an extreme embarrassment to that family. All right. All right. So Jesus, being very unorthodox here, says, oh, this is what we're going to do. You're going to fill the water pots. Water pots? What water pots? The cleaning water pots. These are things that they use to clean people's dirty feet with because they're walking around in sandals. 
And Jesus said, fill that. Let me help you understand what he's saying at the end days. In the end of times, in Joel chapter 2, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Even the dirty water pots are going to be full. The people that you thought didn't have a word from the Lord, but God was working in them, they're going to be filled up with the spirit. It won't just be coming from pulpits and pastors, but everyone that God puts the spirit in, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Fill up the dirty water pot. And they responded, it said, by filling it to the brim. I need you to understand the activation of the obedience that they had. God puts us in places to where we are going about to go through extreme embarrassment, extreme shame, extreme pain, or whatever is necessary for it to be extreme to get you to the place where all you do is rely on him because you have nothing else to rely on. So when Jesus said, take the dirty water pots and fill them up, they filled it all the way up. They said, we don't know what you're going to do, but here they go. It's full. They responded in faith. And then he said, now draw it out and give it to the governor of the feast. Yeah. Oh, Come on. Do you understand that that's the worst person to give it to? All right. They're trying to avoid shame. Yeah. And you going to go and take the governor who just asked for wine and give him some dirty water pot and bring it up to his mouth and say, here you go. <laughs> that's so faith. And it says, as he drank it, it became wine. Yeah. Yeah. It was their faith. Yes. 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 When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants knew, which drew the water, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man doth set forth good wine, and when all men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but you kept the good wine until now. When you get to a place where you have nothing that you can do other than trust in God, when you get to your last, your last nerve, your last ability, your last dollar, your last anything, and you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes, and you fill that water pot up to the brim, God says, I will take that thing that was supposed to embarrass you and use that to elevate you. Now the governor said, that's the best wine I ever had. You saved it for last. The thing that was supposed to bring you down, the kingdom of God turns it on its head and uses that thing to elevate you. Even your own error, even your own mistake, even the position people put you in that had nothing to do with you. God says, I will turn around and everybody's going to see you blessed because of your faith. But I need you to understand that first Jesus said, my time has not come. Yet, let me explain to you what he meant. There are seasons. People call it dispensations. I'm sure you've heard, many of you theologians have heard that word, dispensations. Yes. It is different ways that God deals with his people based on the seasons. Let me go through and show you some of these dispensations, some of these seasons that have shifted to make sure we have an understanding. There was the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. They didn't have a Bible. We have a Bible. They had what was called the law and the prophets. They studied the law of Moses, and then they had prophets that all prophesied about a better time that was coming. And the better time that was coming that they prophesied about was the kingdom of God. Yeah, amen. But it started with the law. Yeah. So Moses brings the law in Exodus. But prior to him bringing the law, God dealt differently with his people. Let me show you how dispensations work. If you look at Exodus 16, before the law is given, you see the people murmuring and complaining because they wanted some food. They were murmuring, complaining, and whining about both. Even though God had just brought them out of Egypt and showed them all these miracles, they lost their faith and were murmuring and complaining, but God did not punish them because the law had not yet been given. He simply gave them man. In the next chapter, they murmured and complained again because they were thirsty. And this time they lined up and were ready to kill Moses, the prophet. And God still had grace and mercy on them and hit told them to strike a walk and gave them water. 
It was not until Exodus 19 when the law is given that the dispensation shifts and God then begins to punish them when they murmur and complain. There was no punishment prior to the law. There was a seasonal shift. Yeah, come on. And when, as soon as the law came down, you know the story, Moses came down the mountain with Ten Commandments, and before he even got to the bottom, he saw the people dancing before a false god, and immediately 3,000 men, the Bible says, died that day. But Paul writes it this way. He says, the letter, the law, killeth, but the spirit give life. He's contrasting an old dispensation, an old season, to a new season. So 3,000 people died the day the law was given, but the day this Holy Ghost came down in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were saved. There was a contrast in how God dealt with his people. Yeah, yeah. It was a shift yeah. in seasons. <laughs> this is the reason God showed me during my time he was speaking to me, I believe it was during the 30 days, he showed me, because I didn't understand it, much as you love Moses, why didn't Moses get to go into the promised land? All right. Moses talked about the promised land, dealt with these people for 40 years, clearly he was one of your favorites, the Bible says he was so powerful that when he died, the angels and Satan fought over his body, so clearly this is a special man, but he died prior to getting into right before they walked in. Why did he die? God said because he represented the law. And the promised land represented the kingdom. The promise. And the law had to end prior. There is no room for the old and the new. Jesus said it this way. There, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. So Moses had to die first. And then they entered the promise. After that, they have the prophets, the law and the prophets. Well, the prophets prophesied that a better time was coming. The kingdom of God is coming. See, when we go back and we read from a kingdom understanding, we can start seeing things different. Isaiah 9 and 6, we read it every time uh, it's Christmas time. And unto us a child is born, a son is given. It goes on to say, and the government will be on his shoulder. What does he bring? A country, a government. It continues and it says, and of the increase of that government there shall be. No end. No end. Amen. So they were prophesying about what was coming. Amen. But still, there had to be a shift in dispensations before Jesus could bring the government. So they had the law that was represented by Moses. But then they had the prophets. And the final prophet also had to die first prior to Jesus' ministry. So the final of the prophets that prophesy about Jesus was John the Baptist. I know he's in the New Testament, but he's still under the dispensation of the Old Testament because he came before Jesus. Amen. And so Jesus said, matter of fact, the very last statement in the Old Testament said it this way, I will send Elijah my servant before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Jesus then says, Elijah will come in the future, in this last end days, in the seven year tribulation, there will be Elijah coming back and he's going to, him and another witness will preach the gospel to the people. Amen. And they will have so much power if enemies come up against them, they'll literally be able to blow fire out of their mouth to destroy their enemies. Yet, Three and a half years in, I'm going to allow them to die. Why? Because the dispensation had to end. How do you know? Well, there's seven seals that are happening in, in the Revelation. And the seven, every time a seal opens up, something terrible happens on the earth. But the last seal opens up, the only thing that happens is Elijah dies. Yeah. And then there's the angels in heaven and they say, now yeah. the kingdoms of the God of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. It was a shift. Yeah. But see, that's before God brings a physical kingdom. God says, I brought it spiritually now and I put it in your heart. So God had to send a spiritual Elijah and he called him 
John the Baptist. Jesus said it in Matthew 17. John is Elijah that was to come. He is the spiritual Elijah because I brought a spiritual government. So John had to go to jail and then die in jail prior to Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, it says, And when Jesus heard that John went to jail, he then went to Galilee because the prophecy says he starts his ministry in Galilee. And it says, And from that day he began to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. Let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And when Jesus heard that John went to jail, he then began to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. The time has been fulfilled. Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. After that, the kingdom is preached, and everyone presses into it. So John had to end his ministry. Before Jesus began, well, we found here in John chapter 2 with this first miracle that it says in the very next chapter, John hadn't gone to jail yet. What does that mean? That means that Jesus' time literally had not yet begun. That's what he meant when he said, my time has not yet come. But the faith of the people pulled a miracle out out of season. God is saying in this time, seasons are shifting and my grace and my glory are being lifted from the earth. And we're going to see famine and pestilence and trouble. But those that have faith, I will bless you out of season. Those who stay in the house of God, I will prepare you and take care of you out of season. This is what Jesus meant when he showed us this miracle out of my time has not come yet. Jeremiah 17 and 7, our focal scripture says it perfectly. It says, blessed is the man whose hope the Lord is. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You will not see when he comes, but your leaf will remain green even in the time of drought. It says you won't even have to be careful. When everybody else is going through famine, you're going to be green. When everybody else is going through sickness, you're going to be blessed. When everybody else is worried about a pandemic, I'm going to take care of you because your faith will restore you and bless you out of season. I have a different dispensation for you because of your I need you to understand that Jesus actually didn't even perform this miracle. It wasn't Jesus that did it. He simply showed them how to use their faith to pull the seasons together themselves. He said, this is what you do. It's not my time yet, but she said, listen to me. So go fill those water pots up and give it to the one man that would embarrass you. And your faith will cause it to become wine. Yes. It was faith. It wasn't even Jesus. It wasn't his time yet. It continues. You continually see this consistent theme throughout the Bible. The lady with the issue of blood. It was her faith. It wasn't Jesus. Clearly Jesus didn't even know she was coming. It said he was on his way to Jairus' house to heal a dead situation. His daughter had died. Some of us have been in dead situations for a long time. And we're waiting on Jesus to come and resurrect a whole other testimony. But while he was on his way there, this woman who had an issue of blood for so many years, she didn't know what to do. It says she pressed her way to him. I need you to understand the significance of this being out of season. The law says if you have an issue of blood, you aren't allowed to come out of your house. You can't touch anybody, because if you touch anybody, they become unclean. But it says she pressed her way. She broke the law. She pressed, she touched all kinds of people. Everybody got dirty. I'm going to get this blessing today. And she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and he felt the virtue and said, who touched me? It was her faith, not Jesus. Out of season. The seasons are shifting, but your leaf will be green when your hope is with God. 
the season is shifting, the dispensations are changing, but we will remain green even when the heat comes because of faith. Your miracles will come even out of season. There is a testimony we started telling very recently. I'm going to tell you this because it certainly matches what we're talking about. I own a state farm agency, and in my agency, I live on the good side of town. What that means is my office is in a part area where there people have money, they're wealthy. And a homeless lady walked into my office, clearly on drugs. Now, what was unusual about this is I've never seen anybody homeless or begging anywhere on this entire side of town. I've been in Asia for 10 years. But somehow she came and walked into my office. And she simply said, I need $20. I have nowhere to stay. All the shelters are full. And I looked at her, and I almost gave her $20 just so she could get out of my office. But I had compassion, and something said, no. Nope. Call on the prayer warrior. Your wife is in the back office running her own business. So I called her out and I said, hey, this lady asked for $20. I'm going to let you deal with that. And Tina, somehow right on cue, looked at the woman dead in her eyes and said the most unusual thing. She looked at that woman and said, do you believe you're going to get a financial miracle today? Now the woman didn't smell good, didn't look right, was clearly on drugs and was asking for $20, but Tina didn't acknowledge any of that. She simply said, do you believe you'll get a financial miracle today? And I literally saw that woman sober up at that moment. Her eyes got big and she said, well, yes I do. God says, I will let you get down to your last point so you have no other ability but to rely on me so your faith can get you a miracle out of So they proceed to go to the back of the office and they start praying. And I don't mean no little happy prayer. I mean a happy prayer in a state farm office. I heard my wife talking in tongues. Then I heard two people talking in tongues. The homeless woman was talking in tongues. And then they got started getting real happy. I almost banged on the wall twice because I didn't want any customers to come in and wonder what was going on. But I said, you know what? I ain't going to stop. I'm going to just have a David David dance. David dance. And they, they thought he looked crazy too. We're just going to have that area here. So I let them continue on. And they were praising for about 20 minutes. At the end of the 20 minutes, they started making phone calls. They found the woman a place to live. She ended up having a place to live, I believe, for the next six weeks. But then right before she left, she had sobered up enough, I guess. I don't know what happened, but she turned around and says, you know what, I think I have a lawyer. Can you call my lawyer? We thought the drugs had kicked back in, so we were about to just put her back under another desk. Time to go back and pray again, just come on. <laughs> But we had faith. Tina had promised her a financial miracle. Maybe there was more. So we just asked questions, trying to figure out, well, who is this lawyer? So we started making some phone calls. It turned out we reached what was probably the number one lawyer in the entire city. Yes. Office is a penthouse yes. on the top floor of a high building. And when the secretary answered the phone, she transferred to him. He picked up and said, woman, I've been looking for you. Y'all right. don't understand. I got faith, but I had to see this for myself. I closed my office, locked the door, put her in the car, and drove her to the office myself. I said, we're going to see this. We went to the top floor. We met with the lawyer, and he said, I've been looking for you, I think he said, for years. And he said, I have an $18,000 check with your name on it. Out of, see, clearly this was out of season. She just sold it up 10 minutes ago. God doesn't care what your situation looks like. Matter of fact, he says the gospel is for the poor and the destitute. The worse off you are, the more access you have to this government that I brought you. And this government has the ability to change your life in one praise. God went on further and told me every prophet that it was in the Old Testament was looking for what you have but they couldn't get it because the kingdom hadn't been brought yet. It wasn't yet their season. 
so they can only access bits of it by faith, yeah. pulling yeah. things out of season into their time. Want me to prove it to you? There is a chapter in the Bible called the Hall of Faith. The whole chapter is only about faith. We love to preach out of this chapter in the Bible. It's Hebrews chapter 11. It begins yeah. by saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It then goes on in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. It says, we need to understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So things that appear were created by things that do not appear. Let me help you understand what that means. It means I sent an invisible kingdom and the invisible kingdom created your physical world. Meaning the invisible kingdom is more powerful than your physical world. And if you understand and concentrate on the invisible, you will rise up in the visible. Come on, come on, come on. It goes on in verse 6 and says, but without faith is it impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then it goes into all the prophets. It talks about Noah. It talks about Moses. It talks about Sarah. It talks about Abraham. It talks about Enoch, the first man translated, the first man raptured. It talks about all these people with faith that the context that we have been missing because we didn't have the kingdom mindset was that it was not simply saying they got this because of faith. It was saying they got this in spite of being out of season. Yes. Let me read it to you. The kingdom had not yet been brought. So in Hebrews 11 verse 10, it says, For he was looking for a city who, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Yes. Talking about Abraham. Verse 13, it says, All these people I just told you about, they died in faith, not having received the promise. But having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Verse 14 brings it to you more plainly. It says, for they that say such things declare plainly they are seeking a country. I know. Yeah. Verse 16, but they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath to well, prepare for them a city. Hebrews 11 ends by saying this, and all these, having obtained a good report, received not the promise, because God had provided something better for us, and they without us could not be made perfect. He said, I brought you something greater, a government, and when you understand this thing through faith, faith. I will shift the seasons of your life and it won't match where you came from but I will take everything that was meant to bring you down and use that same thing to elevate you. All you got is a dirty water pot. I'm going to fill it up with the best wine they ever had. If this is all you can offer it doesn't matter because your faith will bring you to a miracle. I want to talk about a friend of mine, a young man, good friend of mine. He was 19 years old and he walks into my office and I literally almost was looking in a mirror. I saw faith in him. I didn't know him at the time, a 19 year old kid. But I saw so much faith in him, God moved on me and said, just make sure you bless this little man. He said, well, I want to start a business. I said, well, okay, you can use my house to have your meetings. Gave him access to my house. He started his business, two people, five people. And he said, God is moving on my heart to make sure my business blesses people to know Christ. So he started having business meetings, but then he would have an altar call. <laughs> All right. And the people would actually get saved. And his business started growing. And as his business grew, I watched, and then next thing you know, he called me. He said, you know a lot of pastors, right? I said, yes. He said, he should call some pastors because these people are getting saved. I need them to get baptized. I'm going to baptize them. So then he would rent out a church and start baptizing people. I said, okay. And he told his story many times, and he says he and his, his now wonderful wife, he, they said they were going from house to house, but they didn't have the things they needed. She tells an amazing story about her car and how her car trunk door wouldn't even close. They, she had to wire up something where she would pull a, le a pull of string inside the car to close the trunk door while she was driving on her way to tell people about their business. So I said, you can use my house. <laughs> 
and it grew. And the more they put God first, it continued to grow. Three weeks ago, I witnessed 20,000 people come, come into a stadium to celebrate how much God had magnified their business. There was a certain level that you have to get to, and it's very difficult to get to that level. And you only have through the year to get to that level. And he was trying to get there, and then the pandemic hit. And I wanted to call him up and encourage him and tell him, you can be blessed out of season. But before I could even tell him, I called him up and said, look, I don't want you to worry about uh, not making it to where you're going to go. I believe that God is going to bless you anyway. But before I could even get it out, I said, how is your business doing? He said, oh, those qualifications that I have until the end of the year to make, yeah, it's February. We'll be done next week. Amen. God says, I will bless you out of season. Let me break down how this works. When he hit that level, just from the financial standpoint, so he can have an understanding. Now, at this point on, he's 29 years old. His children's children's children will be millionaires. And that's not even the crazy part. I went and witnessed 20,000 people celebrating them because of the level that the God had magnified them to. And at the end of the meeting, they had testimony service where he talked about God. And then the next day, he invited them back, and they all talked about God, and they had an altar call at a business meeting. And I watched over a 1,000 people come to Christ at a business meeting, and the business was elevated out of season. I've seen so many testimonies like that. I just chose to tell, tell this one. I've seen so many. And it simply is when you use your faith, yes. uh, yeah. you can pull a miracle anytime you want it. God said at the end days, yeah, there will be a falling away, but seasons are shifting, and I want to begin calling unusual people, people you would call dirty water pots, and I'm going to fill them up with my spirit, because he says, all flesh, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and you will begin to prophesy, and you will begin to have visions, and you will begin to dream dreams, if you have faith in God. He will sustain you out of season. The seasons are shifting, but your leaf will remain green.